Hello, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Haytai Heritage Center. Okay, good. I am Angela Lee. I'm the executive and artistic director here at the Haytai Heritage Center. Noel James and I started a conversation about a year ago talking about how the Haytai Heritage Center. Let me, let me trade you. <laughs> Better? Can you hear me? Okay. About a year or so ago, Noel James and I started a conversation about how we could strengthen the collaboration between our two organizations, the Haytai Heritage Center and the Carolina Theater. Those conversations led to us talking about bringing this production to Haytai. We started talking about it and making preliminary plans. Nicole, re um, Noel retired from that position. Shana Adams came on board. The conversations resumed, and here we are tonight. I'm so glad that we're able to present this beautiful production here at the Haytai Heritage Center. The original date had to be rescheduled, but in some ways this is even better because we celebrate a lot. You know, we celebrate the heritage of both of our organizations. We celebrate the life of a wonderful playwright. And we celebrate this month where we get to celebrate in a different type of way all of the beautiful history and heritage of African Americans. So tonight, I'm going to ask you to join me in welcoming to the stage the Senior Director of Education and Community Development or Community Engagement at the Carolina Theater, Shana Adams. Thank you, Angela. And I'd like to again thank Angela Lee, Brittany Talley, and the entire Haytai Heritage Center team for for partnering with us, collaborating with us to bring A Walk in August, the premiere presentation of A Walk in August here this evening. This piece we are about to experience was written and crafted by James A. Wayne. Williams is a Broadway actor and mainstay of Twin Cities Theater. He's a founding member of Penumbra Theater in St. Paul, Minnesota. He performed in all 10 plays in August Wilson's canon and is nationally recognized interpreter of the playwright. He appeared in Radio Goth on Broadway and his off-Broadway off credits include August Wilson's Jitney, Marion Critton's Walkers, The Piano Lesson, and My Children, My Africa. His regional credits include multiple roles in August Wilson's 20th Century Cycle at the Kennedy Center. James was nominated for an NAACP Image Award and named Artist of the Year by the Minneapolis Star Tribune in 2008. Please help me welcome James A. Williams for his premier presentation of A Walk in August. First and foremost, I'm a storyteller. It's the way I see the world, the way I process information. Some people look at a painting and see the delicate brush strokes or the subtle shading of colors or the interplay of light and shadow on the canvas. I look at a picture and I create stories based on the thoughts that come to life in my mind from the subject matter. You see, it's not the smile of the Mona Lisa that intrigues me, but the act of imagining the infinite possibilities that exist behind that smile. I find myself sitting in a company apartment in downtown Atlanta, and I've just hung up the phone. Word has gotten out. Mr. Wilson has cancer. Prognosis is I've been talking to 
through a communicative time. And he wants to know what do you think Mr. Wilson's legacy would be? <laughs> He's asking me because I am currently rehearsing the second leg of the play, the tenth and final play. Mr. Wilson's 20th century. In my heart, I will always be a kid in the Blue Mile Village Housing Project. This, there never really was a plan. In my heart, it's an average black boy growing up. One day, I got called to the nurse's office. The only thing I remember about the test is they showed me a flashcard of a cowboy and an Indian locked in hand-to-hand -hand combat and asked me if I noticed anything different. The only thing I noticed was that the sun and their shadows we're on the same side. <laughs> well, later in the year, I graduated from elementary school, and finally, I was about to go across the street to Washington Branch, the school where my older brother and sister and most of my friends went. I opened my report card and looked at the bottom to find my school assignment, and I saw Four words. Walnut Park Gifted Program. And my life would never be the same. The following September, first day of school, my mother awoke me. I bathed and put on my clothes and picked up my brand new satchel and headed out of the door at 5.45 in the morning to the corner of King's Highway and Page to catch the first of my two-city bus, two-hour bus ride from the safety and security of my all-black neighborhood into an all-white neighborhood that wanted nothing to do with me. <laughs> Sometimes, when I think about it, I got on that bus when I was two years old, and it feels like I have never gotten off of it. I met August Wilson in 1978 at Penumbra Theater Company, where our director, Claude Purdy, had been instrumental in convincing August to move to the Twin Cities from Pittsburgh because uh, the artistic climate was conducive to African-American arts. In other words, they started paying us for what we were doing for free. Now, this wasn't out of any great love for our art or our culture. But what had happened was state and county and city governments had found funding for something called the Actors Theater of St. Now, in their rush to create St. Paul competition for Minneapolis' Guthrie Theater, they used federal tax dollars. And then they found out there was not a person of color on staff for the entire theater, a complete violation of federal law. So they scrambled to find funding in something called the Comprehensive Employment Training Act, or the CEDA program two-year program to teach job skills to the unemployed to fund the black arts program. They guessed that we would give up after our two years ran out. But they were wrong. See, we were a multicultural theater company dedicated to non-traditional with our roots firmly in the black arts movement. 
We did everything from Ed Williams to Neil Simon to The Escape or A Leap to Freedom. Freedom. The first published script by an African-American playwright, William Wells Brown. What we discovered on that journey was the power of telling our stories our way. And one day on this rehearsal break, Claude pointed to a, a light-skinned man standing in the back of a house wearing uh, a Borsalino hat and smoking a cigarette. Yeah, that's the 70s, so in them days we smoked indoors. And he said, That's my partner August from Pittsburgh. He says he's a poet, but he's really a playwright. I'm trying to get him to move here. And just like that, I was introduced to the greatest storyteller I would ever meet. Now, I would like to say that I knew it right away, but I didn't. Over the next seven years, we did two of his plays. The first one, Black Bart and the Sacred Hills. It was a stew of a play, part musical, part satire, part Greek tragedy. The audience didn't know what to make of it, but the critics did. They hated it. The only thing I remember about the process is Claude insisted that I learn how to say a monologue on one breath. He would yell. Come on, dog, faster. Pick it up. <laughs> Look, my brother, you speak into the punctuation. Speak to the thought. Try it again. I tried, but I still couldn't get it. Again, you can't let it drag. Find the rhythm and ride it. Push that shit. We sat there for 90 minutes until I got it. His words, those moments, are still. child in a sea of black workers, I was terrified. See, I'd never ridden a city bus by myself before. Uh, in them days, black mothers did not miss a day of work. And we couldn't afford it anyway. My brother and my sister had to go to school, so I memorized my instructions by heart. And in case I forgot where I was going, I had a note that uh, was a fail safe. Take the King's Highway bus to Penrose Avenue. Get off and catch the Lee bus to Riverview and Thecla. Remember to ask for a transfer, and you'll see the school on the corner. I stood there surrounded by black workers going to work, coming home from work. Uh, and maybe some of them were thinking, What the hell is this kid doing here? Oh, who would let the child be out here this time of morning? Maybe they were just too tired at 6 a.m. to think about anything. But when the bus arrived and the doors opened, I was swept up the stairs by the crowd. I stood there at the fare box and put my 30 cents in and took my transfer, like I was told. And I found a seat and sat next to this woman, placing my briefcase between it's amazing what goes through the mind of a child fighting fear and sleep at six o'clock in the morning. Huh. I dozed off. Easton, Easton Avenue. St. Louis Avenue. Oh, I was doing all right until the woman sitting next to me got up and uh, a white man sat down and took her place. We rode along in silence until he said, My, my, you're a long way from home, ain't you? You sure you ain't lost? Mentally, I turned my satchel into a force field. 
Penrose. Penrose Avenue. In my 30s, through a variety of twists and turns, I became a member of the Guthrie Theater Classical Repertory Company. See, uh, I had started acting by accident. I was a, a student on the campus of St. Louis University's Upward Bound program. I was standing in front of the student union one day smoking a cigarette and the drama teacher came out. And I thought she was going to catch me. She said, Was that a cigarette? Oh, oh, oh Miss Wood. I, I was thinking, uh, I wanted to ask you, how can I join your acting class? And to my surprise, she let me. Now, while I was at Penumbra, we learned acting as OJT, on-the-job training, CETA program, remember? Uh, <laughs> I learned how to eat, breathe, sleep as the character. And it made it difficult for me to separate myself intellectually and physically from the role at the play's end. <laughs> See, at Penumbra, it was important that we learn how to tell the story right. After all, we were black artists telling black stories in my heart, I wanted a shot of Shakespeare. Moliere, Chekhov, the entire repertory of uh, black uh, classical theater. I mean, that's what real actors did, right? <laughs> and in my heart, I always wondered, was I a real actor? At the Guthrie, I started out as an understudy. And eventually, I earned a season contract. It was opening day of Pierre Cornier's The Illusion. I was playing Friedemont, the father of the main character, my first big Guthrie role. Now, in rehearsal, I was constantly hearing, James, try a different approach. He's far more intellectually driven than you are making him. To get my technique that uh, I was being pushed to bring uh, an intellectual approach to circumstances that I was experiencing at that time. Uh, my teenage son had run away from home just like Freedomont. And I didn't know where to find him like Freedomont. And my pride. And my stubbornness were the web that was driving us apart. And it provided motivation for me to throw myself into my work. I, I was struggling to bring this to the role without divulging its personal nature. He's too hot, too emotional. His humanity stems from a more cerebral, eternal place. Eventually, I yielded. And soon, our director started telling me how well I was handling the verse. And best of all, he could understand me. Predomance humanity is in clear focus now. You've made great strides. You should be proud of the work. But I knew what I felt. And I wanted something more. But... Maybe they were right. I mean, they liked it. And they knew what real acting was, right? So, they released us early the day of opening. We had some time on our hands. Hmm. And it was also opening day for John Singleton's Boys in the Hood. So I figured, 
Why not? I got time to kill. <laughs> I sat there in the theater amazed. And when the film ended, I was overwhelmed. I had gone to movies all my life. And for the first time, I saw my story on the screen. See, Cuba Gooding was me. See, Cuba got out of Ice Cube's car just like I had gotten out of Joe Russell's car the night that we set out to avenge my best friend Alonzo Dotson's murder. Joe understood what I did. This ain't you, James. Get out the damn car. Joe pushed me out of the life before mm -hmm. I could trap myself into it. Now, here I was, the day of opening for my first big role on a major venue uh, in, in an American theater, and I go see this movie, and it tells me that everything that happened in my life was just a twist of fate. As I drove back to the theater, my life, my son, my career, all swirled into my head. I got to my dressing room, and I swallowed all that anxiety and feeling, and walked out on the stage and let Pretermont's humanity shine through just like On a rare day off, I got a call from my sister Carol in Houston. Uh, now, it's strange for one of us to call each other out of the blue. See, we are not chatters. Uh, like the people in Mr. Wilson's world, we rarely call each other to just to see how you're doing. So a call from a family member means somebody's sick, needs a favor, or in need of money. So before I could say anything, she started. I just saw this play about mom and daddy. What? I just saw this play about mom and daddy. They talked about Marcella, Kathy, Indianapolis, and all of it. <laughs> Wait, I, I, what are you talking about? I saw this play, Fences, by this guy, July Winston, or something like that. <laughs> it was about mama and daddy. Yeah, I, I know about it. You talking about August Wilson? Yeah, uh, in fact, they're they're doing it here. But uh, what do you mean, Indianapolis? See, I'm the baby of the family. I was born after they came back from Indiana, and I didn't know anything about it. And no one ever talked about that. When I was 14, I met a girl named Kathy Flynn in Junior Achievement. She was just about six months older than me to the day. We started talking, and we hit it off right away. I came home, and I told my brother about her, and he said, let me see her picture, which was strange. But I pointed her out in the Junior Achievement photo. He said, you can't go out with her. That's your sister. <laughs> and turned and walked away. <laughs> I was talking to my sister, I said, Carol, I, I, I don't know anything about Indiana. She said, see the play, call me, and we'll talk. I sat there that night. Watching Troy and Rose Maxson's lives unfold before my very eyes. And when it got to the place where Rose starts telling Corey about growing into his manhood, I thought about when my mother, at the first sign of hatred towards my absentee father, sat me down and explained to me why it was vitally important for my relationship with him to remain independent of hers. When I got home, I called my sister. And she told me how our mother's best friend at that time, Marcella, followed our father 
to Indianapolis when he was supposed to be starting a job and uh, finding a place for us to stay. She stayed there until her pregnancy became too obvious to show, to hide. She returned to St. Louis and my mother found out. That sense of betrayal never left her and changed her for the rest of her life. I sat down in that theater thinking that I was Corey, the son who left home looking for his manhood. By the play's end, I realized I was Raynell, the child born after all the events had happened who never knew the details, but learned to live with the aftershocks. One way or another, I decided I was going to get in on some of this Wilson work, but it damn sure wasn't going to happen at the Guthrie where I was. See, over at Penumbra, they are doing piano lesson, and Joe Turner's come and gone, while at the Guthrie, we're, we're doing uh, Skin of Our Teeth, Marat Saad, A Christmas Carol, <laughs> The Winter's Tale, but I had what I wanted. Classical training, Feldenkrais technique, East Indian dance, and weekly vocal work. <laughs> this was around the time that Mr. Wilson wrote the ground on which I stand. His response to an essay in the New York Times by Robert Brewster, which stated, Theater works best as the unifying rather than a segregating medium. Hence, black theater is an unnecessary phenomenon. Hmm. August believed. Black theater, like black experience, is unique and distinct. We cannot allow others to have authority over our culture and spiritual products. We reject any attempt to blot us out. We're on a break during the Winter's Tale rehearsal because the Guthrie's Viewpoint is to agree with Brewstein because that's what we are, a, cla a classical repertory company who believes in colorblind casting. A and during that break, the actors are talking to each other about our work and a question comes to me. Hey, Doug, do you believe there was such a thing as colorblind casting? After all, you worked at Penumbra for all these years and you're here now, so you have to agree? These are innocent enough questions question on the outside, but they didn't need to know what I felt. <laughs> but my question will continue. Only a man of limited intelligence could come to that conclusion. Only an enlightened artist can envision the world as we're shaping it. Color or culture should never be a determining factor in the artistic exploration of the human experience. Okay. Now I have to respond. All right, then how come every character I've played since I've been here has been thought of as colorless? When I respond the way I think the character should, I'm always told that it's too something. It's too emotional or too realistic or too threatening to our audience. Until I take all of me out of it, and then everything's okay. Now, if you can't answer that, then how come our vocal coach strives to push all of the Missouri out of my speech while your Wisconsin or his Indiana is okay? That's just an overreaction to an intellectual discussion of the artist at work. Wow. It only serves to prove how divisive of a factor it can become. James, you've effectively proven the point. So much attention was given to what was going on at our theater that they allocated funds to examine works called classic from a non-European perspective. The Guthrie's response was to produce that of the salesman with an all-black Roman play. Oh, it was a great experience exploring this American classic, but the forces 
that drove <laughs> the Lomans were not the same that would drive the average black American family in the 50s. Our black director decided to ignore this. And we became a chocolate dip version of the family that Mr. Miller had created. Nationally, <laughs> our salesmen infuriated the black theater community. It was called an invalidation of black voices. We had tried it over thousands of playwrights to get to Arthur Miller to give voice to black dissatisfaction with the pursuit of doing that kind of thing. Mr. Wilson called our company cultural imperialists, an assault on our presence, an insult to our intelligence. So after five years being there, I grew tired of trying to figure out what it meant to get smaller roles and larger paychecks. I was exhausted with the notion that my black feet should be grateful to walk around in white shoes. So I left. I had my training, but I had lost the story. <laughs> How could I get it back? And bills have to be paid, so I took a job at Sheridan Global Elementary School, directing the third grade production of Anansi and the Moss Covered Rock, and that's where I put all that Guthrie trained into use. <laughs> come on, come on, repeat after me. If a dog chews shoes, whose shoes does he choose? If a dog chews shoes, whose shoes does he choose? Excellent. <laughs> Let's try a different one. Um, fuzzy Wuzzy was a bear. Fuzzy Wuzzy had no hair. Fuzzy Wuzzy wasn't fuzzy, was he? Fuzzy Wuzzy was a bear. Fuzzy Wuzzy had no hair. Fuzzy Wuzzy wasn't fuzzy, was he? Okay, we'll keep working on that one. But now let's try a new one. You know New York, you need New York. You know you need unique New York. You know New York, unique. Unique New York, you know you need unique New York. <laughs> okay, we'll keep. Uh, Jason, remember, take a full breath before you roar so people can hear you. Man, I am whipping these eight-year-olds into prime Guthrie shape. <laughs> Opening night, they are popping their consonants and getting to the ends of their words. Now, Jason. But despite everything I tried, I couldn't get him to roar loudly. And he had this magnificent paper mache lion head that his mother had made for him that he loved. Opening night, he slipped and fell while climbing on the moss covered rock. And the lion head fell off and burst at his feet in a million pieces. The poor boy stood Game. Jane, get up, baby. Come on. Keep going. You got this. You can do it. Chest swelled, and he let out a roar that broke down the house. <laughs> and that's when I remembered why I did this. For the night the lion head falls apart, the magic of telling the story. second bus. The Lee bus was very different. First of all, I had never seen a white bus driver before. Now, you may not believe this, but I grew up during de facto segregation. And we rode in something called service cars. 
They were modified town cars with flip-up jump seats, and they ran across pre-specified routes. Every 15 minutes, they picked up black families trying to get to and from different places and dropped them at specific routes in predetermined destinations. I gave the driver my transfer card, and I asked, excuse me, can you Sure, son. You're lucky. That's the end of the line. of everything that went on during the colorblind casting controversy the governing new artistic director suggested joint production of fences with Penumbra Theater Company hmm. Claude was directing it yet and I was picked to play Bono Troy's best friend. Finally, I was getting another shot at the play that brought my family together. And at the last place, I thought it was going to happen. The Guthrie. <laughs> but it had been years since I had said August's words. And so I was having trouble catching on to the rhythms. Then during a break, in the rehearsal process, we sat and we talked about the old penumbra days. And I realized I had known these people for over 20 years. I didn't have to make anything up. The real question was, was I brave enough to live with that truth? I decided to give it a shot. Because if it didn't work, I could always technique it. Uh, we got into rehearsal. And I looked at the actor playing Troy and just said the words, no tricks, no spins. I just said the words. <laughs> and then something familiar started to happen. And I couldn't figure it out, but I promised myself I wouldn't try. ended up magically in Pittsburgh in 1957. Opening night, August was there. He seemed pleased. And during the course of the run, the rhythms became more and more familiar. And then I recognized it was the Missouri that the theater coach and the vocal coach worked so hard hard to try to get out of my system. <laughs> it fit like an old pair of shoes. And I started enjoying the hell out of wearing them. <laughs> <laughs> I got a chance to walk in my mother and father's world and explore it through their eyes. second bus, we passed through pristine, well-manicured baseball fields, complete with lights for night games. We crossed the freeway. I had never been this far away from home. 
continual smile was met with scorn or completely ignored. I began to give up hope that another black face would get on the bus. Not even my satchel for field would protect me anymore. So I turned my gaze outside the bus and fixed my attention on the ride from my chariot to a burial field. <laughs> my next losing ah was seven guitars. I played Headley. There was a fire and alarm fire going on inside of him. And there was a smoldering blaze going on inside of me. See, I was discovering the power of using this language. <laughs> Unspoken conversations with my son swirled in my brain. And like a good Catholic, I refused to get a divorce, even though my wife and I had lived in the same house for two years. All of this was starting to work on me. But Headley allowed me a place to put all my rage in its full fury. In his pain, I found strength. By searching the dark places of his soul, I learned. I was discovering the power of the song. <laughs> Marion McLean. I met Marion McLean in 1976. We were at mixed blood here, our first professional job. Now, while I was at the Guthrie, Marion was at Penumbra directing piano lessons. Joe Turner's come and gone. <laughs> Marion, when August and Lloyd Richards parted ways, he picked Marion to direct the first full-length production of Jitney. And Marion would go on to direct King Hedley II, and the Ma Rainey revival on Broadway. Huh. Marion asked me to come to Baltimore to do Lorraine Hansberry's Lead Blocks. And our friendship was rekindled. But right now, Marion was going to Pittsburgh to direct Fences. And my name came up to play Bono, and August said yes. August Wilson in Pittsburgh is transformational. Everything, the topography, the uh, air quality, <laughs> it, it, it all enhances the no-nonsense demeanor of the people, the sheer effort it takes for you to walk up and down those hills daily to get from one place to another leaves you no patience for bullshit. You say what you mean, and you mean what you say. I was in Pittsburgh learning to live it, to eat it, to breathe it. In it, I learned the value of all the sacrifices my ancestors had made that allowed me to make the choices that were beyond their wildest dreams. When I was 19, I left St. Louis to go to college in Minnesota. One winter's day, I was looking out my dorm window in a blizzard, and I saw a man run out of his house to his Cadillac, start it, and run back in without locking the car door. <laughs> I said, OK, I'm going to watch this. Car ran. 20 minutes, and nobody stole it. That's when I said, I'm going to live here. <laughs> My people never understood that. 
And when I decided to become an actor, they understood that even less. So for 20 years, I tried to get someone from my family to come and see me perform. But Minnesota was too far. And everybody thought that it never got warm. So <laughs> one day I came up with an idea. I called my brother. Hey, Dan, why don't you and Donna come meet me in Chicago? Yeah, a friend of mine is directing a play there, and I really think you would enjoy it. Hey, I will cover the tickets if you get the hotel. See, that way I could at least go to places that you probably did in Chicago. The play? Just no. Now, my family are not theater people. They are moviegoers, they are avid readers, but they are not theater people. But they sat there in the audience that night having the time of their lives. So much so, they were renaming characters in the play after people in the neighborhood where we grew up with. So instead of boost of Becker, Fielding, and Youngblood, it was Moochie, Romy, Quanky, and Mr. Cole. Then the scene came that I was looking for. It's the scene where Youngblood tells Rena, his fiance, the reasons for all of his unexplained absences. See, he's been working overtime to save money so he can surprise her with a house. And when she said that, my sister-in-law's mouth dropped open and she started laughing. And she laughed and she laughed until people started looking at her. <laughs> See, this was their story. One time when I was at home, my brother surprised his wife with a house. At the play's end, she said to my brother, <laughs> She said everything I wish I had all these years. James, who wrote this? Whoever he is, he must have grown up on you, kid. Is that what you do? Yeah. Let me know when the next one is. I'll be there. As for that 10-year-old boy, looking out the window at his yet unlived life, I took that bus ride for four years. Five days See, the King's Highway bus ran down an industrial corridor. There was a department store, a grocery store, a, a radio station, a, a hospital, a, a hospital, a post office. There were apartment buildings and the steel mill. ran through a residential district. And looking outside that window, I learned that there were people who actually wore black tape on TV with white picket fences surrounding yards with swing sets in them and single family dwellings with flagpoles that flew the American flag with no trash on the streets, no boarded up windows. And my 10 year old mind started to imagine what life was like inside of those places. I learned to look at their lives from the outside, not realizing that I was teaching myself to look at my life from the outside too. And I began to feel like 
there was something that I was missing. Before the next one happened, a major change happened in my life. I became a born again Christian. It was very different from the Catholicism that I grew up with. Oh, you could actually talk to God without an intermediary. So one day I'm at the service with head bowed and eyes closed and the pastor makes the altar call. Who wants to make Jesus Lord of their life? My hands shot up. And when I opened my eyes, I was by myself. Now, this was not a storefront church. There were only over 500 people at the service that day. And I confidently strolled toward the altar secure in the fact that I was where God wanted me to be. And this confident sense of security allowed me to shed my guilt and shame. But it also provided me building material for my next trip to Mr. Wilson's Pittsburgh. It was my third jitney. See, I was too young at that time but I knew his pain. He was a proud man who somehow or another felt that he had disappointed his son and his wife. He was willing to go the extra mile for any of his trials, but he couldn't find it in his heart to forgive his son. For me, it was my father. I wanted to find a way to extend myself to him, but I could not. And in rehearsals, we would talk about the power of forgiveness and the need for unconditional familial love. And it plays in when Booster picks up that pay phone and answers it. He discovers what his father couldn't, the power. So he has space for his healing to begin. It plays in. My brother met me in the lobby and said, I'm sorry. I should have been here sooner. All these years and I never knew what you were doing. 2001, I got married again. Every man and the woman he feels is the one that got away. Mine was Sherry. I proposed, she accepted, and we both got cold feet and scat. <laughs> I'd heard that she was happily married and had become a mother. But this time when we ran into each other, she was divorced, I was divorced. And we were both born again Christians. So six months later, we are married and headed in a car to Michigan because I've been asked to play chore in fences at Central Michigan University. Now, professionally, taking the job made sense, but personally, it was a disaster. See, Sharon had been a stage manager who left the business to become a mother. And we talked about me staying in the business before we got married, and she said it was cool. But what we found out was, as long as we stayed in Minnesota, everything was fine. But life on the road was a different matter. We came back from Michigan with an uneasy peace. One day, I'm on my way out the door for one of my three jobs that I'm holding, trying to keep things together, and the phone rings. And it's Mary. What are you doing now? You're going to get a call from the Jitney producers. They've lost the Mac, and they want you to come to New York and fill in for the rest of the run. They'll fly you in and put you up. 
It's an open in the contract. Can you do it? How much time do I have? They need you now, ASAP, brother. Everything inside of me wanted to say yes, but instead, I said, I gotta talk to my wife. I called home. We agreed to talk that night, and then I got a call from the producers telling me I only had a week before I had to make the decision. That night I got home and we talked and she said, yes, it was what I had always been working for. It would be hard, but I could live off of the per diem and send my paycheck home. So for the next six days, I find replacements for my job. I, I make travel arrangements, I'm packing, for a trip I don't know how long it's gonna be, and just when I'm about to leave that next day, I get a phone call from her pastor. Yeah, things have disintegrated so far, we will go into different churches. You should talk to your wife. She's upset you made the decision without consulting her. I think you have a responsibility to do what's best for your family. <laughs> I was dumbfounded, I called home. Okay, wait a minute, you told me this was okay. Uh, so, what's going on? I changed my mind and was afraid to tell you. Can't you ask for more time? Her fear is coming into full flare. Look, plane tickets have been bought. Apartments have been rented. Uh, schedules have been changed. If I back out on these people now, I can never talk to them again. Now, my fear is in full play. How can she be so unreasonable? I'm going, I said. Just like that, the decision was made. Now, this is the same Jitney company that I had taken my family to see in Chicago. They had been on the road for four years, crisscrossing the country, developing their rhythms in uh, some of the great regional theaters across the country. They come into New York off-Broadway. They are the only August Wilson play at that time to hit New York and not be on Broadway. So they're dealing with that disappointment. Now, years earlier, August had heard my nickname, Doug, and gave it to one of the characters in the play. The theater grapevine had twisted it to say that the original dub was coming in. Oh. So, when I hit New York, I got 10 days to get ready. So, I'm memorizing lines during the day, and <laughs> I'm uh, sitting in the theater watching the show at night, and then I come home and I fight with my wife. Long She's starting to wear at me. But we reach a compromise. And Sharon says that <laughs> she and her daughter will come to New York if we start marriage counseling sessions over the phone with her pastor. I say yes. But I'm still sitting in the balcony watching the shows at night, and I can't quite catch their complex jazz rhythm. Then it all falls apart. One night, Sharon claims during a counseling session with her pastor that she never said she would come and join me. Oh, I did not need this. I'm at the theater that night and I look up and I notice that there's a ton of wing space invisible to the audiences and the actors. And I decide to stand there and mouth the lines with my soon to be scene partners from Hidden Books. My first performance, I step in and they are expecting a different rhythm and I fall right into theirs. By my third performance, we're working off of each other and I'm accepted into the family. For the next three months, I work and walk the boards with some of the best in the business. And I come away confident 
in the fact that I can handle Mr. Wilson's language as well as any of them. <laughs> Once again, I can't hold a marriage together. I am living out of my car at the age of 50 years old. Then God smiles on me. Marion has rented an apartment in St. Paul. But he's on the road so much that he rarely uses it. So he lets me use it, and it's a place for me to lick my wounds as I get my life together. Then I find out Penumbra Theater is remounting two trains down. And they ask me to play Memphis Lee. I read the script. See, the word nigga is used 82 times in two trains running, more than any of the other cycle plays. But Memphis is of my father's generation. So I decided to go to St. Louis and listen to my father. He's managing my stepmother's bar, the Zodiac Lounge. I sit in the Zodiac and I listen to the small talk. <laughs> <laughs> what was that nigga's name? Who? Man, I don't know. Uh, you know the nigga I'm talking about. Oh, you mean that nigga used to live on Newstead. <laughs> the only time I ever got Mr. Wilson's language, I'd go home and there it is in front of me in its full glory. Now, Memphis Lee became more than a role. He was a revelation. His message being, if you want to move forward, you got to go back and come face to face with yourself, especially in the parts where you fall short. In my life and my work, I had always felt like I was bound up by a fear of my inner self. See, I knew where I failed, and I rarely pushed myself to go there again. If I wasn't tested, I couldn't fall short. But God had forgiven me. The question became, could I forgive myself? In his interviews, Mr. Wilson always said that he would listen to his characters and let them tell him what comes next. <laughs> if I was who I thought I was, Down your lines, learn to fly, and get out the way. Could I let go? I came close. I came very close. And people loved it. They named me the best actor in Minnesota in 2003. But I knew there was something. inside like I was still on that bus looking at my life from the outside. There was still something missing. I would get another shot at Memphis two years later, but in those two years, a lot of what my brother calls grown folks stuff. mother died. You think you have a grip on things until your bedrock snaps. She had never come to see me perform. No amount of persuasion by my brother or sister could convince her to come to Minnesota. Marion had asked me to come do Joe Turner. And I wanted to with every fiber of my being, but my spirit said no. And it turns out that that September, which would have been during the time of the play, she took ill. And I got to spend time with her before she passed. 
And second, I went to Africa. And it changed my whole view of life. I watched people with nothing be grateful for the smallest blessings of clean water, bread, a roof over their heads. They showed the grace to share with strangers without the slightest sense of self-awareness. And I learned from that. If I was who I thought I was, could I get out of the way and let go? I decided this time before I went to Kansas City that my entire family would be there. And I would not be just an actor, but a yielded vessel flowing with Mr. Wilson's word and the inspiration of the gods that told us both what to do. <laughs> and one final performance with August was there. He walked in my dressing room. He said, Black man, you wear Memphis. He shook my hand and walked away. I stood there silent on the outside, but I was boom, yelling and screaming like a kid on the inside because I knew that was as good as he ever gave me. It happened. I had let go. <laughs> a week after we closed, I got a call from a casting agent. Hello, may I speak to James Williams? This is he. It's Hi, I'm calling Sorry, from the Bass cycle. Agency, and August Wilson would like you to submit a taped audition for Radio Golf. I don't know that. I don't think you heard me. Mr. Wilson requests that you send a tape. Huh. And then, I got it. Okay, um, what should I send? Where does he want me to send it? How long do I have? The sides aren't ready yet, so he suggested sending a Memphis monologue ASAP. Okay, the next day, that tape was in there. <laughs> she called again. Hi, James. The sides are finished now, and would you mind sending another tape to us? <laughs> the following day, that tape was in the mail. Three days later, I got the call. They wanted me at Yale Repertory Theater. For the world premiere of August Wilson's Radio Golf. <laughs> they had the meet and greet in the theater. There were 500 people, reporters from New York Times, New York uh, News, USA Today, and any other media outlet you could think of. I knew it was going to be big, but I didn't know it was going to be that big. It was a dream come true. I'm in the room with August Wilson writing words from my mouth. And I'm blowing it. Every lesson I learned in Kansas City, I seem to have lost. One day, I'm in the elevator after rehearsal, and I lean back, and I close my eyes, and I'm contemplating if I am where I'm supposed to be, a hand stops the door from closing and in steps Mr. Wilson. We ride together in silence. Then he turns and looks at me and I start thinking, oh God, here it comes. He's about to send me back to Minnesota. He smiles and says, Dub. You can't be nobody but who you are. It's a line from the play. Later, I would find out what he loved about my Memphis was the ferocity, the, willing to, the willingness to go wherever the lines went without the slightest regard for the audience's affection. He would not have to tell me that again. It was a long, hard pull, but we made it. The day after opening, 
I see Mr. Wilson about to get into his limo and head to the airport. He stops, he turns, he smiles and says, See you in L.A. Just like I was going to be on the second leg of the journey. <laughs> that was the last time I saw him. In L.A., there was a strange Mr. Wilson was supposed to be there. He's at every leg on the trip. I call Marion, and he tells me that August has liver cancer, and the prognosis is not good, and that he decided to forego his medication so he could finish rewrites on the play. So now the gauntlet has been thrown down. How can I be tired to take a day off when this man is spending the last of his life force to finish his mission? I decide that I'm going to sit down and write him a thank you letter. I'm so tired, I fall asleep. A few days later, I get a call from St. Louis. My sister, Right before our first preview, I do the first two shows and then I catch a flight home and go to her funeral. I fly back to LA Tuesday morning. Tuesday afternoon, I am back in rehearsal. Tuesday night, I am back on stage. But in the whirlwind of events, I forgot about the letter until August dies in between stops on the golf tour. I decided it wasn't important that he may never see the letter. But what becomes important is that I finish it. October 2nd, 2005. Dear August, Marion told me of your condition, and I have kept the knowledge confidential. He told me because he knows of the things I wanted to share with you if given the chance. First, please know that you are in my prayers, and I remain confident that God has only his best in store for you and your family. Second, thank you. Not just for Radio Golf, but for everything I've been blessed to learn standing in the light of your truth over these years. God has woven your work into the fabric of my life. When I first saw my rain, when Levy stabbed Toledo, I wept for the first time in years because someone you knew the pain and frustration of my upbringing and accurately portrayed how many of us got mad at the grocer and shot the shoemaker. My first thought was, why is he telling this to all these white people? When I moved from St. Louis, I chose to walk away from the fear of violence and thought and deed. I wanted to get off that bus that I had been riding for so many years. I had gone to college to escape what I thought was an inevitable outcome. But in that theatrical moment was everything I wanted to believe leave behind. I discovered I was weeping because what I was trying to leave behind was fighting ferociously to stay inside of me because it is me. And then I saw unconditionally with all our flaws and imperfections. You weren't telling them. You were holding up a mirror and daring us to love ourselves. You were creating a way to grab a hold of our ancestors' strength and to use it. 
to study their shortcomings and learn how to envision a different outcome for the future. Not just to survive, but to live as if we were intended. As if that first slave ship had never reached its destination. I learned working on your characters to embrace every part of my life. The betrayals, the pain and the shame, as well as the happiness and joy. That critic asked what I thought should be your legacy. There are those who will speak of your literary contributions, the Tonys, the Pulitzers, and the countless other playwriting awards, or how you've opened the doors for black actors, designers, directors, and playwrights, or the way you've shown producers that audiences were paid to hear our stories and not just watch us sing and dance. But for me, you will always be the man so dedicated to his mission that you taught me how to live mine. Every time I walk with you, I walk away with hope. Thank you. Love. Okay for me to take questions? Okay, I'm gonna take that silence as yes. Um, as Shayla said, this is um, a world premiere. First of all, thank you all for showing up. This is the first time that I have. <clears throat> Yeah, and, and it's, it's a process. So I, if, there, if you have any questions or anything that you would like to ask about or things that you want to say something about before you head home, you know, in other words, you got a chance to ask the playwright or the actor, whichever you prefer. And since I can't see in the dark, um, can can I get? Okay. Thanks, Dem. Okay. Yes. Am I who I think I am? There's no doubt. I, I know whose child I am. I know who to say thank you to. I know where to show my gratitude because nothing is promised. Nothing is promised. And I stand on the shoulders of praying men and women who ask for things for me that I didn't have the ability to ask for for myself. So that means that my job is to ask for things that th for those that are coming after me. Yeah, I do. Yes. Yes. Honestly, I was chasing a woman. <laughs> I was chasing a woman. I, yeah, I'm gonna shame the devil. 
You know, she said, if you want to date me, you got to go to church. And I went. And this is how deep the story is. Right after we went that first couple of times, she went somewhere else and I stayed. And it was like, okay, I, I, you tricked me. But you, <laughs> you know. Yes. I think the question is, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I think the question is, how do I justify being a Wilson, uh, I'll say it, a, Wil a Wilsonite? inside of the whole genre of theater that I do. Um, because I've never, ever heard anyone tell the stories of the neighborhoods that I grew up in or the people that I grew up around as clear as August Wilson. You know, there's a gentleman, I, do you mind, sir? You sure? Okay, I'm looking at him. Uh, that, that's all right. You, yeah, uh, we were talking before the show about the universality of the story, and the thing that I know that Mr. Wilson believes is, is what my favorite playwrights believe, and my favorite playwrights are August Wilson, Ethel Fugard, Shakespeare, and uh, and Marion McClinton. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and very few people know Marion's work, but because they tell stories of the human condition, but they also believe that you don't intentionally set out to write something universal. You write the specific, and when you write the specific, it's like throwing a pebble into the pond. You throw a pebble into the pond, and it radiates out and touches every fish in the lake. And so that's what happens. So there, I do Wilson, I do Shakespeare, I do, I mean, the show, the show I did before this was, thank you, I got to play King Lear. And, uh, and, and what I learned from working with August, because August loved Chekhov. August loved reading good playwrights. And what I learned is that when you work hard, you work hard. You do your research, you work hard, and you only get better. You know, And that was the thing that I fell in love with about this. And I gotta figure out a way to say it inside of this. What I fell in love with was the idea that I could get better. You know, not, not like where I was was bad, but I had found that, you know, by smoking a cigarette in front of a student union, I, whew, and I hadn't thought about it that way until right now. A gift was handed to me that took me through the rest of my life, you know, and that became a desire, of, uh, the, the desire to, the, thi the, the thing to stop fearing what I was, or what I thought, or, or, or the fact that I didn't know what I was. A platform came to me to show me how I could become. And that became even more important in the desire. I learned, I learned, I went everything, there's a book, everything I learned out, I, everything I need to know I learned in kindergarten. Everything I need to know, I, everything I needed to know I learned in a rehearsal room. I'm very serious. For a while, I, I'm a recovering alcoholic. What I found out was if I wanted to get better as an actor, I needed to stop drinking. You know? And I wanted to get better, so I stopped. You know? And, and so that's, that's what this is. And, I'm, and 
I'm in a lot of personal territory, but that's the other thing I found out. I found out by doing this, don't carry that stuff around with you. Sit it down. Okay, I'm a lot deeper than I thought I was going to get. We're supposed to be talking about this play. Yes. I'm, I'm laughing like this because this is unlike anything I've ever done before. Unlike anything I've ever done before. I'm a person who normally I create ritual. Meaning, if I have a cup of Jamaica Blue Mountain coffee in the morning, and I eat two sunny side up eggs with wheat toast through the entire rehearsal process, I'll do that. And what it is, is it, it, and it becomes frustrating to my lovely partner at times because I do that and things that start to ripple that mess with me. And at times I can be intense. You know, at times I can be intense. And I do things like they're the same three songs. Because if, if, if nothing else, you can tell from this that I do not have a very big love of vocal coaches. And so I, there are three songs by Huma Sakela that I sing before every show. You know? It's uh, one called uh, Abangoma, The Healers, uh, The Marketplace, and Stimulop. And they're all from the Hope Live album. And it's the way that I have learned to tell my body, okay, we're getting ready to do a job now. I'm going to need you. And that's this. So I create ritual. And for this, I couldn't do it. I was, if, if y'all had seen me at 5.30 today, you know, I because I I couldn't I couldn't get things to to fit like I wanted them to fit, and and I was I, I was a basket case until right before you guys walked in and saw me sitting at the table. I was a basket case. I was like, okay, I got to walk out of this. I got to okay, I got to go somewhere and scream. No, I don't know Durham. I can't go outside and scream. <laughs> you know, I, I keep hearing, every once in a while, I keep hearing sirens real close back here. <laughs> so if I go scream, I don't know what's going to happen. So, it, 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 and that's, so this has been interesting. This has been a revelation. I've learned so much during this. And I thank you for coming and, and allowing me to learn in front of you, because y'all gonna be y'all y'all a big part of this now, because y'all found some of this was funny, and it was like, funny that's new. <laughs> okay, uh, yes, I saw your hand. It's, that was part of the discovery too. There was a part that I left out. Yeah, I'm gonna tell y'all the truth. Uh, about why I decided I needed technique. Because of the way we learned how to dive into a character and they teach you to dive in, but they don't teach you that you need to build a way out while you dive in. You know, so that's why a whole lot of people in this business go crazy because we have to convince ourselves on stage. If we're doing Romeo and Juliet and I'm playing Romeo, I got to look and fall in love with Juliet every night. Every night. And I convince myself to do that. And eventually, there are, I talked about the waves rippling out. There are waves that happen. I begin to look at this woman and I see things that are lovely about her. 
and, and I make discoveries about this person every night. But then I got to remember that this ain't real. <laughs> this ain't real. I, I got to go home. I can't go home and, 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 and wish that my, my, my partner is somebody else. I can't do that. You know, you can, and you see a lot of it play out on television, and people end up getting divorces after being together for six years or two months or all of this kind of stuff. But what happens, what I found out was the value <coughs> inside of this work, the, the technique was I found myself sitting, watching TV during the, run, during the rehearsal of a show, and I started weeping uncontrollably because Barney Fife only had one bullet. <laughs> and, 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 and it scared me. And, and that was the thing that made me say, I need some technique. I need to know how to get in and get out because I don't want to stay trapped into anything. You know, and, and uh, that's, that's, that's that secret. I'm sorry. Hey. Okay. That's important. That's very important. Out of character. That's very important. Yep. Ladders go in two directions. You know, and and and, and that's it. it, it, it it's. I've had friends who, while playing characters that open doors for them that normally aren't open for them, decide to stay in that character. You know, decide to stay. It's like, oh, okay. So if I talk like this and do all this, the world for, and it's working in real life too. That ain't real. Oh, no. This is my first time doing a show that I wrote.
Tell me a little bit more about what I think about, <coughs> it, 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 just so I, because I, I can sit up here and pontificate right. all day, but uh, just uh, so what about how I think about to facilitate the, those kind of discussions, or is that our responsibility, or um, I think that's theater. I, it, one of the rare things about theater is we just sat here and had, we sat in a room, y'all all faced me, I faced y'all. We breathed the same air, we heard the same thing, and we got a ton of different opinions about it. Now, those of us who are lucky saw this with somebody else, so we can go home on the way and we can, we can air it out. Man, he put me to sleep. Man, I, I mean, we can be, and, and have those honest discussions about it. The best I've ever seen it done, you ready, Jesse? At center stage. They used to do a thing where behind every show, they would just have 20 chairs sitting in the lobby. And they didn't announce it, and they didn't do anything. All they did was they said, if you would like to discuss the play before you go home, sit down in these chairs. And they had no moderator, they had no one there who was the quote unquote authority about it. And people just sat and talked about the play and what came up and what, and, and that, that worked for me. You know, moderated discussions, you know, or for me, or where people get together and go, okay, we'll talk about this, but should we say the word or should we say the N word or what? And, and it becomes, down is a controlled conversation. And what's far more exciting to me is to hear what people, uh, what people are really thinking when they talk to each other. Because that's the whole point of this. The whole point of this is, is to communicate and to establish the idea that all stories are worth telling. You know, I don't have to live your story. I can at least give you the respect of listening. Any other questions? Yes. Oh, no. First and foremost, the lady sitting behind you is a dear friend of mine named Noel James. And Noel, while her and her husband Richard were uh, at Colby College in Maine, they asked me if I wanted to come up. They said, she said, well, why don't you do something about your August Wilson time? And I said, okay. Oh, we coming. We coming all the way back around. Because we, we know, we've known each other Noel is a